Greetings from the future. I'm Peter Hall and I'm sorry I can't be there but it's nice to be involved from afar which is Brisbane, Australia where we've probably already made it into tomorrow. The quickening pace of life calls for a rethink of time. What do we mean by that? Well, first of all that we are all familiar with the idea of being busy, juggling deadlines, racing for the plane, ferry, pressed for time but there's also the sense that being busy is slightly illusory. There is always the one who is not busy, as the Zen koan goes. The one meaning not someone else, but you. Or the potential in you to be not busy in the activities that you choose to do. So to sweep, to do dishes, to listen and laugh without being busy, without thinking of the next task, the next thing without desire. The quickening pace of life calls for a rethink of time. What do we mean by that? In another sense, the pace of life we're used to can't continue. We're coming to the end of the modern notion that somehow this is our destiny. To do everything faster, fly around the world, buying stuff, building stuff, accumulating stuff, and then throwing it out. The idea that this can be done without consequence. Modernity has done a great job of hiding from us the consequences of our behavior. When the design project is finished, where does it go? Typically, we might hope for a happy client, a warm reception, a glowing write-up, maybe an award huge sales or millions of hits, and then on to the next project. We fix in our heads a snapshot of the project success, the unveiling of the building, the book launch, the photograph on our website, the congratulatory email, and that snapshot becomes the project. Here's a book of snapshots. All the messy stuff, the research, the work, the materials, the impact, the landfill, all gets hidden behind that snapshot. How do we learn to peel back that snapshot, unravel that narrative? Uh, the answer might be in rethinking the way we perceive time. In terms of design, this means not prioritizing the snapshot, but situating each project within a longer time span. Perhaps this means mapping things, considering things at hand as part of a continuum. So a table, a chair, a plastic milk jug and a still life arrangement are anything but a still life. They might appear to be transfixed in that arrangement, but in truth they're moving, not just at the molecular level, or in the sense that the planet is moving at 18 miles a second, but that their material ingredients have, in the scheme of things, only momentarily come together in these particular arrangements. The jug will be washed, taken over to the Vinyl Haven landfill, where it will decompose over about 500 years. Or someone here, there, uh, might take it to the mainland, where it can be broken down and remade into plastic lumber, outdoor furniture, or a bucket. A thing is, as Bruce Sterling has put it, simply an instantiation of flows. And our task as people who design, photograph, and write about things is to rethink them, firstly, as points on a timeline. We also need to rethink things in terms of their significations, their meanings, which not only change over time, but have a dramatic impact on how we perceive and value them. So if we stopped seeing things as snapshots and viewed them as instantiations of flows, How might that change their meaning and effect on us? This is a thought exercise. We're often quite good at noting how a kid has grown bigger, how a friend has aged, or grass looks browner. But in the same light, we might see the past and future of the things around us. Those great shoes you wanted to order online become instantiations of refined petroleum. But this is not quite today's project. For this, Margot and I wanted to see what we can learn from experiments with measuring time itself, not as scientists, 
but as philosophers, artists, designers, humans. Time, as it is, experienced. This first requires looking at time as a construct. Where does the measurement of time come from? The ancient Babylonians, whose mathematics were based on the number 60, were the first to decide that a day, the time it took for the sun to rise, set, and rise again, should be divided up into units of 60. This was not based on observation, but an abstract concept. Since they didn't have fractions, the Babylonians favoured the number 60 because it could be evenly divided by the widest number of other numbers. So 1 times 60 is 60, 2 times 30 is 60, 3 times 20, 4 times 15, 5 times 12, 6 times 10, you know. We could just have easily had a metric system so that an hour might have been 100 minutes, but thanks to the Babylonians, we have 60. So the most familiar non-mechanical clock, the sundial, quite effectively measured the movement of the sun using the shadow of an arm and a circle marked with the numbers on this 60 base system. Another kind of clock used a stick in a bowl of water. Well, sort of, you know, bowl of water measuring that gradually filled up from the water pouring from another bowl with a hole in the bottom. Since water drips at a regular interval, a reasonably accurate account of how many hours had passed could be determined by the height of the water in the bowl against the measuring stick. Confusingly for us, early civilizations used different length sticks at different times of years, a year, so the hours were actually longer in summer than in winter. This arbitrary system has obviously worked quite well, but after a few centuries with the Industrial Revolution, we started to adhere to it more slavishly. Mechanical clocks, which in medieval Europe date back to the 13th century, were becoming increasingly accurate with the introduction of the spring, and were starting to be used to tell the time of day by the 19th century. Hard to believe, but clocks weren't used to tell the time of day before then. In England, which had enjoyed a golden age of clockmaking, technological prowess was the driver for standardising time across the aisles. So prior to 1847, different cities in the UK had different time zones. So Bristol, which is only 118 miles from London, was 20 minutes behind London. With the arrival of the railways, time zones were abandoned. So, and a national railway time system was introduced. So even though Bristol did receive the sunrise a few minutes after London did, it was forced to adopt the same time. This move was fiercely resisted by astronomers and religious organisations who felt that railway aggression was imposing an artificial system against the natural movement of the sun, or God's will as it were. But within 40 years time had been standardised across the world, at least by those nations involved in the shipping trade. The impact of standardization and increased technological precision in the measurement of time has been to literally change the way we think. Not long after the railways standardized time, the movements of factory workers were being analyzed by Frederick Winslow Taylor, the Taylorist, and his scientific management team, with a view toward improving performance. Guided by, quote, thousands of stopwatch observations, Taylor analysed every step in the assembly line to eliminate waste and perfect motion, not of machines but of workers. So the stopwatch, in other words, became the weapon for heightened corporate control over the pace and intensity of work. It occurred to me just recently, uh, as the mechanical voice of the Runkeeper app on my phone loudly and cruelly delivered the workout summary as 4.23 miles at a plodding 11 minute mile rate, that I had turned a formerly enjoyable activity into a tailorist admonishment machine. Running is no longer jogging. With the help of military technology, activity stopped, and performance measurement systems, running is timed, collated, and compared, tagged with personal targets and activity simulated. Activity completed. Workout summary. Total time, 52 seconds. Total distance. 
zero point zero two miles average pace 42 minutes 12 seconds per mile our conventions for representing the passage of time, too, are inextricably entangled with an Enlightenment view of time as a sequential line, rather than, say, a cyclical thing. Daniel Rosenberg and Anthony Grafton, in their book Cartographies of Time, trace a visible allegiance between Christian rationalist views of time and linear representations. They focus on works by Joseph Priestley, cited, by, uh, cited as an 18th century innovator of the linear timeline, who himself suggested that the timeline was a fantasized visual referent for an object without material substance. substance. It appears to guarantee a directionality to past and future history. Henry Bergson referred to this imaginary homogenous time as a deceiving idol. So, to critique the timekeeping legacies of modernity calls for some experimentation. Johanna Drucker and Bethany Nelvinsky's explorations at the University of Virginia's Spec Lab, for example, Spec Lab, for example, included stretchy timelines and other experiments at representing time as experiential and non-homogenous. Europe was mapped according to the difficulty of getting from place to place. A train journey was mapped according to perceived time between stations, and days were mapped according to heavy events and levels of anxiety. Now, this would be a good point at which to show sketches from Lawrence Stern's novel, Tristram Shandy, indicating the non-linear path of a well-told story. The digressions appear as deviations from the straight line. Uh, there's also a, there a diagram from Charles Renouvier's novel, Euchronia, uh, with a chart depicting the theoretical relationship between the course of history and possible alternate paths. And at the bottom there is Hermann Minkowski's diagrams contrasting the Newtonian view of physics in which two observers assign the same point in time to event A with the Einsteinian view of physics, which, uh, in which two observers assign the same events to different points in time. So if experience tells us that time slows down and speeds up, and physics tells us that time literally does run at different rates in the universe, then how might we represent the passage of time differently? This has become a predominant theme in art over recent years. I just saw the exhibition Making Time at Sydney's Museum of Contemporary Art, which included a great film by Daniel Crooks. So it cuts the movements of a Tai Chi expert um, into time slices. Uh, effectively drawing attention to the point made by both Heidegger and the 13th century Zen writer Dogen, that time itself is being and all being is time. I'm going to quote some uh, uh, Zen master Dogen to you now as a, a fumble toward a conclusion. See each thing in this entire world as a moment in time, a moment of time. Things do not hinder one another, just as moments do not hinder one another. So, my hope is that by exploring ways of depicting things as moments of time, of depicting the elasticity of time, we will also encounter ways of travelling through time. If we can show how the present was made and how we are making the future as we speak, as we move, in the way we behave, uh, then we are perhaps one step closer to delivering some kind of subjective shock, some kind of shift in the language. I think it's very hard for us to get away from the common sense view that everything is somehow going to be okay, that the mess we've made will somehow be fixed by the scientific technological progress that got us here. As Zizek has noted, common sense finds it hard to accept that a catastrophe really can occur. Quote, the most difficult 
eth ethical task is thus to unlearn the most basic coordinates of our immersion into our life world. What usually served as the recourse to wisdom is now the source of danger. So I really wish I could be there rather than in rainy, wintry Brisbane to see how this week plays out. Because I think this is an exciting time for design inquiry in its growth and that the topic, fast forward, identifies a really important cultural shift that's underway. It's good to think that we can be part of that shift in what's made out on a little island in Maine and elsewhere. I can't wait to see the results. <laughs>